Hi, it's Dr. Khan with the rest of Chapter 19. We're going to be talking about thunderstorms, tornadoes, and hurricane formation, so severe weather. We'll start with thunderstorms, which is just defined as an event that has thunder and lightning. These are associated with our thunder clouds, our cumulonimbus clouds, typically associated with cold fronts, heavy rainfall. Remember, they are also fast events because cold fronts typically move rather quickly. Occasionally, there'll be hail that's associated with these events. They do require warm, moist air. This is the source of energy for thunderstorms. Once a thunderstorm is cut off from its warm, moist air, it does not have energy to keep going. We also need lifting because warm, moist air by itself will not generate the thunderstorm. We need instability in the atmosphere. So we need a reason that the air is going to be moving upwards and condensing. So this is why cold fronts are often associated with these thunderstorms because we have lifting and we have often very vertical lifting. So quickly lifting warm, wet air is really an instability that it needs in order to keep going. Thunderstorms are very common if we take a look at lightning flashes as kind of a proxy for uh, where these thunderstorms are happening. We'll notice that most of them are equatorial, so around the equator, low latitudes. And then take a look around where we are, at least the center of the United States, and compare it to other places around our same latitude. And notice that we have a lot of thunderstorms compared to areas of similar latitude. And that's because we have the source of warm wet air in the Gulf of Mexico meeting up with this dry Canadian air. So we have the perfect kind of setup for this type of weather. Over here, let's say for example, in the center of Eurasia, we don't have a source of that warm wet air. We have that cold continental air, but no real warm air coming up to create these conditions of instability and generating that moisture that's needed. We do, however, have that over the Indian Ocean where um, as long as the season is right, the water, the wind is coming off of the water and we do generate a lot of thunderstorms as this air is being lifted up uh, the Himalayan mountains. If we take a look, I'm just gonna back up for a second. We're in kind of the 30 to 40 range for number of thunderstorms days per year. Um, and notice Florida, Florida typically is known kind of for its afternoon thunderstorms where you might get, um, it might rain for a half an hour, 20 minutes for several, um, you know, almost every afternoon. So again, we need a continuous supply of warm air that's causing air to rise higher and higher. We typically see gusts of wind, and I'm going to show you kind of where that happens in the formation of the thunderstorm. So first we have what's called the cumulus stage. The cumulus cloud, that puffy cloud, warm air is rising. This is an area of low pressure where air is coming in from all sides and rising. And then we have the mature stage of the thunderstorm. And I just want to give you some direction here. So this is the front of the storm, so it's kind of moving in this direction. It's moving in this direction. And you might notice if you I were to put like a person right here, it might uh, it might serve your memory to think about a thunderstorm event. Um, you might remember that a wind is associated with um, a storm. So we get like windy conditions. It's kind of this cool or cold air um, that can sometimes be quite violent before the rain even starts. So this is this is why, and I think this is kind of cool. So let's follow the air here. We have rising air that's coming up and forming this vertical development, this cumulonimbus cloud. And that air cools as it moves up, and this cold air is now dense. Remember, colder air is denser than warm air, which is going to cause this cold, dense air to sink. And as it sinks and kind of hits the ground, it's going to spread out. So when you're feeling that gust of wind before a thunderstorm, what you're actually feeling is the air that was recently near the top of the thundercloud and has sunk down and is now you know, blowing all the trees around. It's kind of cool to think about. But then afterwards, again, since the storm is moving in this direction, we get this heavy rain, we get lightning, um, and then we get a downdraft associated with the end or the backside of the storm as well. But when this updraft of air and this warm air source is cut off from the thunderstorm, 
uh, we don't get any more updrafts, that it's not going to sustain the storm anymore. The storm will kind of finish its thing. The cold air will sink out of it. The last remaining light rain will fall and the thunderstorm will what's called dissipate or kind of fall apart. Tornadoes are very short duration windstorms that happen because of a rotating column of air. And this is actually interesting too, that this column of air that is typical of a tornado, like if I were to say draw a tornado, you draw kind of a swirly vertical, a kind of column, but they actually start off as rotating columns of air on the ground. So horizontal rotating storms um, or rotating winds. And there's that kind of typical tornado shape. We have this uh, dark cloud that's associated, these thunderstorms that are associated with tornadoes. We have a swirling kind of a column here of air that gets thinner towards the bottom. And then we see at the bottom, the debris, like all the dust and whatever else that tornado has picked up and thrown into the air. We see that debris visible. Sometimes that's like the best image or picture that you're going to get that a tornado is coming is looking at that debris. Tornadoes are associated with a special kind of severe thunderstorm called a supercell. The formation requires, again, same things uh, that would require be required for a thunderstorm. So we need a source of moisture, a source of instability or rising air, and then lifting from a thunderstorm. We also need what's called wind shear. This is a change in wind speed and direction with height. So as we, let's say, start at the surface, the air is moving in a certain direction, but as we go up in the column of air, so as we go up into the atmosphere, that wind direction is actually changing. These occur most often during a cold front and during the spring months when we have a big difference in temperature from our Canadian air mass and from our tropical air masses. So again, I was talking about this, that tornadoes actually begin kind of by like laying down a little bit where we have weaker winds at the surface compared to stronger winds that are happening just above the surface. And this causes a rotation of the air in a horizontal manner. So stronger winds, a, a little bit aloft, and then weaker winds at the surface, we get this spinning that's horizontal in nature. But we also have this updraft. We have a thunderstorm that's, that's forming. So we have an updraft, meaning we're gonna be pulling air upwards. And if this spiral or spinning axis of air gets caught up in this thunderstorm formation, it's going to stand the column of air up. And that's what actually forms the tornado. There's definitely, um, a, you might have heard of Tornado Alley, or this is Tornado Alley. It talks about where we have the most common or most frequent number of tornadoes uh, in our country. And we definitely see uh, a pattern here of this area where our cold Canadian air actually meets up with our wet tropical air. So during that, um, during that time, this cold front that would happen between those two air masses, that's where it's most likely to generate a tornado. This is the number of tornadoes that might form in a given month. We see April and May. So springtime is kind of the peak tornado season. Our strongest winds in nature are created by tornadoes. So they're not the largest storms by any measure. You know, some can be very, very narrow in, in terms of their path of destruction too. This is a storm where one house can be knocked down and the neighbor's house is left standing. Um, but oftentimes when we have loss of life that's associated with these events with tornadoes, it's caused by the flying debris. So the broken up pieces of houses and roofs and trees that come flying through the air at, at these strongest wind speeds that we find in nature. Fewer than 2% of tornadoes in the United States result in deaths. But we do have a scale that measures the intensity and it's the intensity is measured by um, the, the damage that's done by tornadoes. So after a tornado event happens, we have experts that go out and take a look and assess the damage and then assign it a number or value on the EF scale. 
So again, if we're looking at some damage to siding and shingles, but the damage is, is pretty light to buildings or built structures, it's typically because of these wind speeds between 65 and 85 miles per hour, and that's given an EF0 rating on, uh, on the scale. Um, but to take a look, we'll jump here to an EF3 tornado with wind speeds between 136 and 165 miles per hour. Trees that are hardwood trees, the bark will come off of the trees. Um, almost all of the house would be destroyed if it took a direct hit from an EF3. An EF4 would be complete destruction of well-built residents. Uh, school buildings and other well-built uh, brick buildings would uh, have large sections that would be destroyed. An EF5, that's the largest type of tornado with winds in excess of 200 miles an hour. And really, every, significant damage here. You'd have even mid-range and, and high-rise buildings suffering pretty uh, severe damage. Tornadoes are difficult to forecast because they aren't very big and they don't last very long typically, although there are some examples of long-lived tornadoes. Um, when we think the conditions are right for a tornado, we issue a tornado watch. And that's important to differentiate between a watch and a warning. A watch indicates that conditions are prime, like be on the lookout. You need to watch out and maybe listen to weather and have uh, maybe change your plans if you are going to be outdoors because it's possible that a tornado could form. A tornado warning is issued when one of two things happened. Either a tornado is actually seen by an observed trained spotter or we see it on the radar. So we see a spinning on the weather radar it's called a weather, a radar indicated tornado. And the use of Doppler radar has really helped a lot in terms of detecting a spinning motion in the atmosphere and has allowed us to issued, issue warnings of tornadoes sooner than we could have without that kind of data. Uh, your book has a picture of that Doppler radar and you have blue and red indicating opposite directions of motion. So you can actually see kind of a spinning and what that visually looks like on a Doppler radar. And that's again when a tornado warning would be issued because you have air moving in one direction and you have air moving in a different direction and that indicates spinning. 19.6 covers hurricanes. Hurricanes are much, much larger. Uh, we have wind speeds that are fast, but not quite as fast as we see with tornadoes. And these typically occur over tropical oceans and low latitude areas. And they start out as tropical storms and intensify as thunderstorms that then begin to circulate in a cyclonic motion. So counterclockwise in the Northern hemisphere and clockwise in the Southern hemisphere. We need at least 74 miles an hour wind speeds to be considered a hurricane. Anything less, we'll talk about what those designations are as a, as a storm ramps up to become a hurricane. The hurricanes that typically affect North America start as storms off the coast of Africa, intensify over warm waters, just like um, storms that we see in North America. This moist, warm water becomes the energy for a hurricane. So if we have very warm seas, we'll see intensification of a hurricane. And typically we see a few different path possibilities, either it's kind of taking a, a, the southern tip of Mexico or into the Gulf of Mexico and it hits Mexico, or oftentimes we'll see it dump into the Gulf of Mexico and hit Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, the Florida Panhandle, somewhere around here, uh, or it actually bends around and it might hit the east coast of the United States and then up into colder waters. Hurricanes have different names depending on which ocean basin you're in. So they're called typhoons in the Western Pacific and cyclones in the Indian Ocean, but they're all the same thing, they're all hurricanes. The North Pacific has the greatest number of, of these events for every single year. So this starts as a low pressure gradient. Air, remember, in a low pressure, air is moving in, it's converging at the surface, and it's rotating along what's called an eye wall. And eye walls near the center, it's where the air is rising. There's a lot of convective activity. And these are actually the walls of the cumulonimbus clouds that surround the low pressure area. 
the eye wall is where you find the greatest wind speed and also the heaviest rainfall. Although strangely inside of the eye wall, inside the eye of the hurricane, because we have rising air, it's relatively calm and clear. Um, so when you're in the eye of a hurricane, it doesn't appear that there's any storm anymore, but really the other eye wall is about to hit. So if you're safe to kind of venture out, if you think the hurricane is over, it could be because the eye is passing and then you're going to get hit by the most intense winds and rain again when the other side of the eye wall passes. So this again, this is the eye that I was just talking about. We have no precipitation, no winds. It's the warmest part of the storm. People think it's the storm is over and again start to venture out to their great dismay when they're hit by the other side of the eye. This is the eye of a hurricane. It's often seen very clearly in satellite imagery. Um, sometimes the eye wall kind of falls apart and reforms in the cycle here. Condensing water vapor, again, this warm, wet air that's rising is driving this storm as well. Hurricanes are most often developing in late summer because you have enough wet, uh, warm water around the lower latitudes there to um, generate energy and moisture that's needed for the, for the hurricane. So there's a couple ways for hurricanes to die. So either they move over cooler ocean water or they move onto land. Uh, or the large scale flow aloft. In other words, the rising air, it's not favorable for air to rise anymore. So these are the two most common ones that we see in, uh, in our area here, or at least in, in our country, North America. So maybe the hurricane moves out over the Atlantic and continues into the North Atlantic where it's cooler ocean water. That cooler ocean water is not going to sustain the hurricane or hurricanes move onto land from the Gulf of Mexico or from the Atlantic Ocean. Once it moves onto land, it's cut off from the warm ocean air, so it's not going to have enough energy to keep going. We still don't totally understand the process of hurricane formation. We know that, again, storms begin off the coast of Africa for the hurricanes that hit in our country. They start as a tropical depression after that storm organizes, those thunderstorms organize. A tropical depression is at about 38 miles an hour. If the storm intensifies, it'll be upgraded to a tropical storm that's between 38 and 74 miles per hour. At this stage, it's given a name, Tropical Storm Harry, or whatever. Um, and then again, if it intensifies over 74 miles an hour, it becomes a hurricane. It can also be downgraded, so a hurricane that then loses some energy and falls back below 74 miles an hour will be downgraded to a tropical storm. Uh, if it, let's say, a storm continues to move on land and kind of loses its energy and it's only about 38 miles an hour, 37 miles an hour, or 38 miles an hour, um, we would call it a tropical depression if it was still over the tropics. But if it hits, let's say, our country, it's not anymore in the tropics. So it's just a depression or a post-tropical depression. Here we see in, in your book, you have this picture and I'd really recommend looking at that smart figure too about the kind of slicing through a hurricane. So they kind of cut through this hurricane so we could see what's going on on the inside. And that's also interesting too, to see what happens to surface pressure and wind speed as a hurricane passes as well. Notice that the pressure is going to just totally drop as the hurricane is passing. And then after it passes, the pressure rises again. The lowest pressures recorded on Earth have been at the center of a hurricane. Sea surface temperatures drive hurricanes. So again, if we have really warm seas off the coast of Africa, that's going to drive the formation and um, movement of hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. Uh, how much destruction is done depends on the strength of the storm. This is the most important factor. The strength of the storm is usually indicated by the low pressure. How low is the pressure at the center? Um, and then how strong it gets is a factor of the temperature of the sea surface. And then what kind of area does the hurricane hit? Is it largely dense in population? And the shape of the ocean bottom near the shore. 
So do we have kind of a shore with a steep drop off of um, the continent or is there kind of a slope under the water where it's shallow for a while before it actually reaches the land? And that matters because of how much water gets pushed up onto shore. That's called storm surge. And we have a scale that ranks the relative intensities of hurricanes based on their wind speed. So from a one to a five, we call it category. So category one being the weakest and a category five being the most intense. Storm surge, that's the amount of water, the height of the water that's pushed onto shore from the hurricane and that ends up causing the most fatalities or death from hurricanes, not the wind, it's not the rain or flooding, it's actually the storm surge, the water that's pushed onto the shore from the hurricane winds. The storm surge is usually highest where the eye makes landfall, but it depends on actually the what's going on under the surface, so the shape of the land under the surface of the water. Wind damage though is definitely something to worry about and that inland flooding because you're going to get a lot of rain. And while these are significant factors in terms of the destruction of hurricanes, the most deaths are associated with storm surge. Storm surge just clears the land. It scrapes the land from its buildings. Hurricanes are monitored by satellite where we can get a circular air, air pattern that's detected. We can estimate wind speeds. Uh, we actually can also track forecasts uh, in, in, in some cases a week, a week in advance. We can give people a lot of notice and certainly a couple of days notice to evacuate more densely populated areas. We also send drones and un, unpiloted aircraft into hurricanes in order to monitor them as well. And that's it for the rest of chapter 19.